What is going on, Alpha Males? Welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast. The podcast where we talk about what it means to be an alpha male the right way. With God at the center. After all, we are made in His image. Strong, dominant, in control. Well, if you think today in 2022 that America, Europe, the Western world, wherever you listen to this from, could use some more manliness, could use some more alpha males, I'd appreciate it if you liked, subscribe, and just wrote a review of the podcast. It's a cheap, free, easy way, you can do it while you're listening to this, that helps spread the message that men are supposed to be men. Men are supposed to be strong and dominant and in control, and they don't need to apologize for that to anybody. If you want to spread that message, like I said, like, subscribe, leave a review. If you want to check out more while you're listening, check out goodshepherdtraining.com. With that, I'll plug in the bio. You want to skip it, skip to around 3 minutes and 45 seconds ahead of where it starts. First and foremost, I am a servant of God, preacher, a fisher of men. God is number one in my life and everything that I do in this podcast is no different. And I don't apologize for that. A little bit about me in the background. I grew up, I guess what you would consider a heathen. Didn't grow up a Christian. But I grew up in the southeastern United States, what most would consider very poor. Hunting and fishing and shooting. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. After my combat tours in Iraq. I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in law enforcement for several years in LAPD. I worked patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. Where by God's grace, he got me through some nasty places in this world war zones. And some of the nastiest streets in the country. Not because I am better, because God chose to have mercy on me and had a purpose for me. And I'm thankful for that. After my time in law enforcement, I was a private contractor for federal government, for a three-letter government agency I won't specify, doing private contracting work. I'm very much involved in guns and gunfighting. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. I should say my primary MOS is in both branches of the military or infantry as of one sort or another. Specialized infantry in the Marine Corps and an MOS that no longer exists. I started competition shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I won my first gold medal even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've been blessed by God with the talents he's given me to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I've won most of my competitions in rifle and pistol, but I've also competed in archery and shotgun and even muzzleloader, uh, knife throwing, hatchet throwing, I've competed in all that. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide. Like I said, I grew up hunting and, and fishing and shooting. I've done it to put meat on the table because I like to put food on the table with the talents God's given me. I don't apologize for that. I've done it as a professional hunter and guide. I've slain all manner of beast. And guided for all manner of beast. Bear and wolf and elk and deer. Mule deer, white-tailed deer. I've slain ram. And fallow deer and countless animals. And I don't apologize for that either. FBI certified firearms instructor, NRA, and a bunch of other three-letter government agency certifications. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. I've been blessed to be the commander of a tactical team, an SRT special response team in a large metropolitan area, where our primary job was to stop active shooters. But again, first and foremost, I'm a servant of God, called by God to share the good news, preacher. A fisher of men. With that, we will roll into the day's topic.
All right, men, let's get into today's topic. If you've listened for any length of time, you know there's a whole other podcast called Gunfighter Life where we talk about shotguns. And even on Alpha Male, I've talked about the importance of a man being armed and being able to feed himself. And the reason I'm a big fan of the shotgun is not because it's my favorite gun to shoot or because it looks super cool on Instagram or whatever. It's because it's the most utilitarian, most flexible tool. And I got to thinking, what is the version of that in the fishing world? I don't talk a lot about fishing when I was younger. I really loved fishing. I would skip school and go fishing. I love, you know, being out on the water and fishing. My first vehicle I saved up and bought when I was a young, young man, still in school, was not a car. It was a canoe. I saved up and bought a canoe, an old beat up one with a bunch of uh, holes and stuff in it. And I bought a fiberglass kit and patched it up so that I could do more fishing and get to spots where I couldn't get on my feet. I love fishing. I love the experience of fishing and I love the sport of fishing. And it saddens me that a lot of young men today don't have somebody to show them how to fish. And we did a whole episode on manly pursuits of fishing that you can check out. But I was thinking, what's kind of the shotgun of the fishing world? What gives you the most amount of flexibility, um, the highest return on investment in that world? And I'm going to tell you that I think, from my years of fishing experience, that it is a six-foot, medium action spin cast reel and i guess you should explain a little bit about what that is you can look look for those if you're wanting to get into fishing or if you're already into fishing and you don't have one but basically there's probably others but there's three main types of fishing reel there's your push button which you think of as little kids using it's the simplest to use it's the ones you think about like to have mickey mouse or the little mermaid on it or something where you literally press a button and fling it and let the button go, and the line flies off the top, and then you just reel it back in. That's the easiest one, but I don't think it's the most flexible. I think it's good if you're going to hand it to a bunch of kids, and you don't have to spend half the day untangling stuff. They're great for that, but for even a young person to an adult, I don't think that's the best choice, and I love baitcast. Baitcast is my personal favorite. I love baitcast for largemouth bass. I love baitcast in the ocean. I love baitcast, especially top water. You know, when the the water's nice and warm, I really, really like that. But that's not the most versatile. The other one is your spin cast. This one, I think, is the most versatile. It's... For an adult, it's not super complicated. It doesn't have a high barrier of entry, a high learning curve. It's pretty easy. You can learn how to do it in one session. So what this is, it's the one, the fishing reel that you grab. And let's say the rod is closest to you. The reel is further away from you. Sometimes you'll see people fishing with these things upside down. So I don't want, if you're getting into fishing, I don't want you to be that guy. Uh, You grab the rod and the reel hangs down in front of you, further away from you. It hangs down. And it's got what's called a bail. And you grab the line in your finger and hold it against the rod and flip the bail up. And then you throw, you cast, it's called casting if you don't know, but you cast. You go from basically, and this can depend on your type of stroke and all kinds of things, but your basic cast is from about... If you're making your arm like a clock from about, um, you know, 2.30 and then to about 11.30. And you do that motion and you throw the bait out. And then when the bait hits the water, you flip the bail back over and you reel it in. And you don't have to worry about getting backlash, commonly referred to as a bird's nest. It can happen if your line's twisted or something. But Again, this is a fairly easy rod and reel to use. Again, I like the bait cast. It's more of a surgical precision instrument, but it takes a long, long time to master. Like I said, this you could learn in a session, in an afternoon of fishing. It's a spin cast reel. And I'm talking about like the best all around. So if you're looking to get into fishing, are you looking to get into a different kind of fishing and just explore new, new ways to fish? Then a six foot long medium action. Um, to explain actions might take a little bit, but basically think about lighter actions for more delicate work. And usually, 
usually um, smaller fish and heavier actions for stiffer work for bigger fish. So if I wanted to catch really, really big catfish, I would use a heavy action rod. If I wanted to catch little teeny tiny trout in a stream, I would use a light action rod. And then you go light, medium light, medium, medium heavy, heavy. There's probably some other ones in between there, but that's kind of similar to like a shotgun choke if you're thinking about that. But your your medium weight is kind of like your modified choke. A six foot long is pretty standard length. You could go five, six, you could go six, six, but six foot, let's call it your most versatile medium action rod. It's a great fishing rod. And with a good medium size spin cast reel and 10 pound test. Now you may decide after your first fishing trip or something that 10 pound test is not the ideal, but it's right in the middle. You know, if you're going mostly for sunfish and smaller trout, you're not going to want 10 pound test. And if you're going for heavy catfish or bigger surfish, you're not going to want 10 pound test. But that's a good place to start. It'll work for just about anything, especially a good quality fishing line. And fishing line is probably one of your least expensive parts of fishing. So start with 10 pound test and you'll figure out pretty quickly what test you want to settle on. But it's a pretty common standard for bass fishing for all kinds of fishing. And let me talk about why I like this setup and why I think you should have it, even if you are an expert fisherman or an experienced fisherman, but especially a novice. Because I can take this setup to some place I've never been. You know, I can take this to a lake I've never been on, you know, with a variety of lures or bait. And I can reasonably expect to catch something. I can take this to a river I've never seen in, in a, I've, I've been to pretty much all the 50 states except for two. But I could take this to an area I've never been, a, a river I've never seen, an area of a river I've never seen. And with just a few choices in baits and lures, I can expect to catch something. I can take this to Florida in the surf or in what I would call tide water, in tidal waters, bays, estuaries. And I can reasonably expect with those same assortments of baits and lures to catch something. Now, I don't want to take this deep sea fishing. I don't want to take this for shark, but you're getting into kind of the obscurities of fishing. It's not a fly fishing rod, but I can take it on a fly fishing stream and with some stuff I'll talk about later, catch trout, catch rainbow trout, catch brown trout, catch whatever or whatever. I'm mostly talking about American fish. I know I have, by God's grace, a lot of foreign listeners, but Whatever I'm talking about, I'll try and describe it, and there's probably a similar species where you live that you can catch with this setup. So if fishing at all intrigues you, if being able to feed yourself at all intrigues you, if just getting out in nature, turning off your smartphone, and you know, seeing a fish dance on the end of your line in the sunlight at all intrigues you, this is a good place to start. And this is a good thing to have in your vehicle, just in case, just in case you find yourself on a day off somewhere where you can go fishing or you go on a trip and for some reason something happens and plans get canceled and hey, there's a river or a lake nearby. Let me, let me throw a line in there. This is a good setup to have. You're looking, you're already into fishing. You're looking for a good gift for somebody to get them into fishing. You know, this would be my number one recommendation. And again, a six foot medium action with a spin cast reel and 10 pound test. Let me talk about some go-to baits and lures. Now I'm not, I don't like fishing with live bait, but it is probably the easiest and most effective way. So if you're going to get into it, that's fine. Um, there's, I guess two main ways to fish. There's a lot of subcategories, but you fish from the top and fish from the bottom. Fishing from the top, you're going to get what's called a float or a bobber and suspend the bait down from it. You know, this is your classic kind of iconic. You throw a bobber, which is like a little thing that floats on the water out with some bait dangling down from it. Iconically, you know, a worm on the end of a hook and you throw that out and fish bites it and pulls it down. And then you pull back on the rod and reel it in and you have a fish. That's probably your easiest way to catch fish, which is probably why it's one of my least favorite ways to catch fish. But there you go. You have a couple of hooks. Hooks, again, are cheap, a dollar or two. Um, number 10, number six, number eight, a good assortment 
Um, I would say have, you know, one of each of those sizes. I would gear towards the smaller size hooks because you can catch a big fish on a small hook, but you cannot catch a small fish on a really big hook. I mean, it can happen. It can be some kind of anomaly, but I can catch a really, really big fish on a tiny, tiny hook. So gear towards the smaller hooks and you have your bobber and then you suspend the bait on there and you literally cast it out and you watch the bobber. And when it gets pulled down, there's a fish on it or something. And then you set the hook, which is just yanking back on the rod and you reel it in and you take said fish off and either throw it back or eat it. So that's fishing from the top. Fishing from the bottom, you get what's called a sinker. And it's usually a piece of lead or a piece of steel or something like that. You could use anything. You could use an old car nut or washer. You don't have to spend a ton of money here. And a hook. And you cast it out. And you let it sit on the bottom with a worm or a minnow or whatever. A grasshopper. You know, whatever you want to use. Um, a shrimp. Whatever. And you set it out there. And you this is a little bit more tricky because you have to keep tension on it. So... The easiest way to do it is just hold it until you can barely feel the weight on there. When you feel this, you know, thumping or tapping on the rod, that's just an indication that something's messing with your bait. When you think they're on there, you set the hook and reel it in. And that's fishing from the bottom. And you can look up visually how to how to put a worm on your hook or put a minnow on your hook or a shrimp. But just try it. I mean, if it doesn't work, it'll fall off and you try a different way. It's it's not super hard. And those are your two main ways for live bait. And then for lures, I'm going to mention a few of the all-around best lures for pretty much anything. And my number one I think anybody should have is an original Rapala. Some people, I say Rapala, some people say Rapala or a variation thereof. It's from one of the Scandinavian countries. If you know exactly how to pronounce it, you know, let me know. But I pronounce it Rapala, and it's original Rapala. And it basically looks like a little, it looks like a little minnow. It's black on top and silver on the bottom. And in just about any environment that you're going to find fish, you're going to find a small minnow that looks like that. A bull minnow if you're in the south or whatever, you know, a baby trout or anything can kind of look like that wherever you are. And and pretty much any fish that's a predatory fish is going to try and eat those little minnows. So again, you can catch anything from a sunfish to a trout to a bass to saltwater fish to just about anything on this original Rapala. It's pretty much my go-to lure if I'm going somewhere that I don't know what's in there. I, I know what species are likely to be in there, but I, you know, that's my go-to because pretty much anything will eat it. And again, it's an original Rapala and why it's great for beginners you literally cast it out and you reel it back in. Now, there's better ways to do it. There's ways to make it look like an injured or dying minnow. But literally, you could give this to a little kid and they could cast it out and reel it in. And if there's a hungry fish in the area, it's likely he's going to tag that and attack that. So again, original Rapala, they're not super expensive. They're four or five bucks, maybe more now with inflation. I'm not sure. But it's a great all around. You go to a trout stream in the, in the western U.S., you can catch fish with it. You go to some farmer's pond in the backwoods of Tennessee, you can catch fish with it. You go to the saltwater estuaries of Florida, you can catch fish with it. I've never fished in, oh, I guess that's not true. If I went to Europe um, and I went fishing, I what, whatever country, Germany, the UK, I could reasonably expect to catch fish with it. It's a great lure. I think it's worth having. The one downside to it is it has treble hooks, which are three-pronged hooks. They get snagged easily. So if you're fishing in heavy logs, heavy weeds, heavy brush, this is not the go-to lure for that. But for pretty much everything else, it's awesome. My next one is probably my favorite for any kind of bass fishing, but it works for other stuff too. Um, and it's a white skirted grub. I like double tails, but it doesn't have to be a double tail. It can be a single tail. You can look up what this looks like. But if I'm giving an all-around recommendation, it's a white skirted double tail grub on a quarter ounce jig head. A jig head is basically a, if you don't know, it is basically a hook with a weight built into it. And that's pretty simple. And the quarter ounce is good because it's heavy enough to fish off the bottom 
like a jig, meaning you just barely scrape it across the bottom, maybe pick it up a little bit and set it down. You can fish with it like that. You can literally, just like we talked about with the stick bait, the original Rapolo, you can literally cast it out and reel it back in. It's not great, but it'll work. If you know, it'll it'll catch fish like that. If you don't know what you're doing, you could fish it somewhere in the middle where you raise it up in the water column and let it fall back down and do big sweeping arcs of almost to the top and then all the way down. And then when you catch a fish or two, you'll say, oh, they're hitting on the top or, oh, they're hitting on the bottom and either switch to a different bait or just fish it that way. If they're only hitting it on the bottom, then fish from the bottom. I, that just makes sense. And I don't, you'll figure that out on your own if you have an IQ above, you know, what most people, if you have an IQ equivalent to what the average person has, you can figure this out. But again, it's a white skirted double tail grub. And why white? Because it stands out. It works in pretty much any environment. Um, lots of bait fish are white. Lots of other things that fish eat are white, um, have white bellies. So white's a great color. You may decide you want pumpkin seed for where you're fishing or chartreuse or, you know, hot pink. I don't care. But a good place to start is white or black and white if you don't want just white. But anyway, a white skirted double tail grub. And if you don't know, you can take those and rip the skirt off if you want it to appear a little bit smaller to catch small fish. And then you just have a grub. You can, If you have a double tail, you can rip one of the tails off and make it even smaller. And then it just is about as small as you're going to get it. You can rip half of it off and put it on that same jig head to catch really small panfish. I can use the entire thing to catch really big bass. I can flip it around and rip the tails off. And you'll have to look up a picture of this to see what I'm talking about. But you can flip it around and rip the tails off. And then you have a tube. And you can fish it like a tube. You can make it look like a minnow. I can rip the skirt off, leave both tails on, put it on the hook sideways, and make it look like a crawfish. It's a super versatile bait. And especially if I'm going for any kind of bass or ambush predator, that's my go-to. A white skirted double tail grub, especially with a spin cast, I'll skip it up on some lily pads, or I will throw it up under a dock or a bridge, or I will bounce it off some cypress stumps. This really makes me want to go fishing. Um, one of the drawbacks, just a quick aside, of living in the middle of the deserts of Arizona is the lack of fishing opportunity. There are some. Um, but not a lot. But anyway, I digress. The white skirted double tail grub. If you have those two lures and you add the next thing I'm going to talk about, you can pretty much fish anywhere and catch something. And if you don't, it's probably not because you don't have the right bait. Um, the next one, flies. Now, most people think of fly fishing as a fly rod. And a fly is basically just a human analog, a human replica of a bug whatever kind of bug that might be in your area. But they're referred to in the fishing world as flies. And they look like a bug laying on the top of the water. Or sometimes you fish them under the water. You call those wet flies and dry flies. Now, I like fly fishing, but it's not the best all around. It's kind of a specialty thing. If you like the romance and the skill of fly fishing, then that's great. That's not what this episode is about. But if you want to take advantage of fish species that eat a lot of insects, or that's what they're eating this time of the year, you don't need a fly rod to do that. You can fish with the fly rod. You can fish with flies on a regular spin cast rod like we're talking about. The same setup I was talking about. And again, I said fishing line was cheap. You could use 10 pound test for this, but just a dollar or two of just a really small amount of lighter fishing line to make what's called a leader. And you might want two pound test for this or four pound test or six pound test or whatever. But basically you tie the fly onto a bobber like we talked about in the beginning for fishing. You tie that line onto the bobber if you're fishing on top and you make a leader. Let's say a foot, let's say two foot, you know, for your European listeners, you know, a half a meter somewhere in there. So you make this leader and you put the fly on the end. You tie that fly to one end of your bobber and then you tie the regular, you tie that bobber onto the other end of your line on your rod and you cast, you're basically using the weight of the bobber to cast it out because the fly is too light to cast on a traditional rod and reel. So you're basically casting the bobber and the fly is going along with it. They make things called, uh, you know, 
fly bubbles or things that are specifically designed for this, but you can just use a bobber. And if you want to, if you want to fish off the bottom, you literally just grabbed a sinker like we talked about, or a washer for a car, or a nut, or a bolt, or something like that. And you can literally tie your line onto that, and then tie the leader onto that, and a fly onto the other end and cast it out. And there you go. And, you know, if you live in a place where there's a Walmart, which is probably you if you're in America, or somewhere with like a sporting goods store, you could probably get everything we talked about today for $40 or less American. And, you know, prices change with inflation. It may be $80 by the time you listen to this. Who knows? But it's not a lot of money for everything we've talked about. You know, you don't need a $40,000 bass boat and a $600 rod and reel to catch bass. The rig we talked about today will catch largemouth, smallmouth bass. You don't need, you know, a super expensive pair of waders or, you know, a bunch of expensive fly fishing gear to go out on a beautiful trout stream and catch trout. The thing was we talked about today will catch trout. We're obviously just scratching the surface of this, and there's a lot to fishing, obviously. You can use this to feed yourself, but if you're looking from a purely survival standpoint, there are more efficient ways. Um, trot lines, which I did when I was younger, trot lines. Uh, there's also jug fishing. There's also netting, gill netting, um, which I have quite a bit of experience with more than most, and cast nets. There's all kinds of ways, fish traps, that are probably more efficient uses of your time to save calories and catch fish. But if you want to get into fishing and you want a good all-around recreation that will also feed yourself, this is a good place to start. All right, that is going to bring us to the tactical tip of the day. Now, they make things called stringers and like live wells if you catch a fish to put it in, or you could put it in a cooler and carry a cooler to keep your fish fresh if you decide you want to keep it and eat it. But you don't need any of that stuff. What you need is a stick. You take said stick, you stick it through fish's mouth, run it behind the under part of the fish to where the gills end, and you run that straight stick through there. You take a stick, a willow branch, whatever stick you can find, whatever environment you're in, you can probably find a stick. And you take all the other limbs off, so it's just a straight or fairly straight stick. You shove it through the fish's mouth, down the bottom of his gills, and you shove that in the mud or the sand or whatever is where you're fishing. And you put him in just enough water, water that he's submerged in the water. And you stick it far enough into the ground that he can't break it and swim away. Um, for most of your, your eating size fish, this will work just fine. Um, and with a big enough stick, it would work right for any fish. But literally take the stick, shove it in the ground, through the fish, his mouth, down through his gills, and keep him there. And you can do this, you can use the same stick for multiple fish if you want. Or Anyway, you don't need a bunch of fancy equipment, you don't need to bring a cooler, you don't need to bring a bunch of other stuff if you just want to catch fish. I'm kind of a minimalist, you can literally just use a stick and shove it in the ground and keep your fish on there until you're ready to you know, cut them up and fillet them and eat them. Well, that's your tactical tip of the day. Tactical verse of the day is going to be the first part of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. There's just something about being out in the quiet of nature, a, str a peaceful stream, a lake, that I think it's just good for the soul. Jesus often went into the city to save sinners and preach, but he often went out into the wilderness to pray, into the desert places, into nature. And are we not supposed to walk as Jesus walked? This is, this is one way you can do that. I'm also struck to remembrance that several of the disciples were fishermen. With that, man, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Alpha Male podcast if you've listened for any length of time, you know why I started this. I was preaching uh, for the U.S. Army and for the Salvation Army. 
And I saw a great need for young men. In fact, in the Army, we did something called resiliency training to try and toughen up these young men to make them men, to be suitable as soldiers. And I saw a need. And I thought that the podcast would be a way to reach more, especially young men, but pretty much any man. And uh, I will not say anything bad about my father. I'm not going to say my father was never around as a kid. I saw him infrequently from time to time. And I'm thankful for all the things that my father taught me and, and, and showed me. But my father to this day does not speak to me. And a lot of young men grow up out there without a strong, manly Christian figure in their life to help shepherd them. So I started this podcast for that reason. I would encourage you to do what you can. If you look around and think some of the men today, especially young men, could use some toughening up, could use some shepherding, could use some alpha male in their life, I would encourage you to go out there and you be that alpha male. If you know how to fish, find a young man who wants to go or is willing and take them fishing or hunting or shooting or Invite them to a Bible study or to work out anything like that. Don't have to be perfect. Trust me, I am certainly not that. One way is to support the Alpha Male podcast. I'm not talking about the patrons. You may think listening to this, that uh, this podcast is on iTunes and Google and it has a bunch of listeners and it must have a bunch of patrons You know, last I checked, which was pretty recent, I got asked how many patrons I have. And I think it was eight last time I checked pretty recently. I have great patrons. You can support for as little as a dollar a day, but none of my patrons only give a dollar. If you you listen for any length of time, you'll know that I used to do this podcast a couple of times a year. And somebody reached out to ask if they could support the podcast. So I thought if somebody was willing to do that, I ought to be willing to do it more. And by God's grace, we usually do this several times a week. That's because of the support of patrons. Um, Heretofore, I work a full-time job, and this is not it. I'm doing this on my one day off beside Sabbath where I rest in between chores. In fact, right now I'm sitting outside the dog park to let my dog get some energy out and socialize him. All that to say, if you want to help this podcast grow, if you want this to be more than what it is now, If you want to be a part of it, if you think this is a message that other men need to hear, there are several ways that you can do that. You don't have to give money. You can, like I said literally in the beginning, like, subscribe, and write a quick review of the podcast. It takes less than five minutes. It won't cost you anything. So if you haven't, if you've listened, and you think this message is worth getting out there, if you think young men need to hear this, not this particular episode, but things like it, please consider doing that. If you want to support on Patreon, again, goodshepherdtraining.com is your one-stop shop. And then Patreon has a lot of perks, but I mostly want you to support because you think it's the right thing to do as a man and as an alpha male. Instead of just being a passive listener, be an active participant, consider going to Patreon. You can sign up there for the fraction of the cost of a rod and reel, for the fraction of the cost of a box of ammo, for the fraction of the cost of an expensive city cup of coffee. You can be an active participant and help share the message with other young men as one way, not the only way to help young men who maybe don't have that father or don't have a good alpha Christian man in their life. I would encourage you to at least consider it, pray about it. And if not, no worries. My God supplies all my needs. And whether or not you support or don't support, that doesn't absolve you of the personal responsibility as an alpha male to shepherd those other young men in your life, to be the salt and light to them, to encourage them, to help them be men in the image of God, strong and dominant and moral and just and brave. With that, men, I want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Alpha Male Podcast and have a blessed day.